So I'm really pleased that Emily and Caroline could join me for this conversation. When, when I saw or heard from Caroline about the book, um, the Strengths Based Organization, as a coach, it was really of interest to me um, as, as a topic, anything to do with positive psychology usually is. So I was, I was really pleased that Caroline and Emily could make the time today for, for, the, for the session. First of all, thank you uh, for, for joining me. Uh, just say to the group, we've, we, I've, got, I've got some questions I want to take uh, Emily and Caroline through, but again, if anything is resonating, please add that to the chat panel and I can always introduce something if we, we do have, have time. But let me just um, start with some introductions. So, and Emily, if there's anything you want to add to this, but just, I suppose, as a headline, you're, you're the founder of Applied Psychology and you're a chartered occupational psychologist. Um, anything else you want to add in terms of your your work? No, I think I think I want to get on to talking about the book, so that's okay. absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and Caroline, you, uh, you know, you you work uh, with with Emily at Applied Psych Psychology, but also um, I know you as an associate director with with Atkins, where you know also you you perform the role as an internal coach. So as always, I just want to check if there's anything you want to add to to your work. Yeah, I, um, I guess the thing for me is that I started out as an engineer, so uh, engineer for much of my career. And Damien, as you know, I became a coach more recently um, uh, with you as my course director. So uh, now coaching and transformational work, um, but from really from within organisations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So so let's get into the conversation. Um, and let's just start with, I suppose, the topic of positive psychology and why, why you focused on positive psychology. So, so Emily, if I come to you first with that question. So um, I think there's more and more recognition um, kind of across all fields, actually, of the role of emotion, how important emotion is in driving behaviour. And yet I kind of think in the workplace that's been neglected to some degree. So there's quite a lot of focus that's been around process or control within organisations and emotion doesn't kind of fit into that box. So perhaps it hasn't been... Um, understood or thought about or applied as much as it, it could be. Um, but positive psychology for me is all about recognizing and engaging with emotions and generally with positive ones, but also recognizing the negative ones as well. Um, um, you know, the, the point of that is because we know we can have significant impact on various outcomes if we do that, if we really engage with people's emotions. Mm, thank you. Shall I just Shall add I? Yeah, please. Um, I, I think, like you said at the start, Damien, um, positive psychology is an approach that really resonates with Emily and I. Um, and we started working together about 10 years ago. Uh, and as we started, the, there was a the research base around positive psychology was really starting to develop and take off. Um, but at the same time, what we were noticing was that the importance of business metrics around inclusivity and well-being, as well as performance, was really starting to take off. Of course, that was all way pre-pandemic it's now even more the case now um, so we started playing a lot of the work I was doing uh, was within Atkins Emily was playing with some other organizations as well and the positive psychology the strengths and appreciative inquiry approaches really started to take hold so what we experienced was a pull for it so you know that's when we started talking about there's something in this and, and especially around inclusivity I think that was the first area that there's really something around inclusivity here and um, well-being has grown from there as well and, and I guess all of it really grew from that. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I, um, I mean, I really resonate with what you're you're both sharing in terms of you know as a coach, emotions being at the heart of our work when we think about creating change. But I think what's also, I suppose, exciting and interesting for me is is I suppose with the, the pragmatism in terms of the way that you're bringing um, positive psychology and this concept to to organizational systems especially when you think about some of the the areas you just spoke about Caroline there in terms mm -hmm. of diversity and inclusion etc so so let me just pick up on this the, the book the strengths based organization then and, and fundamentally why why you chose to write the book then you know so, so Emily again I'll come to you if that's okay yeah, sure. So, um, so I've been a psychologist for a long time, for um, over 25 years. And I think, uh, you know, I'm passionate about psychology, but I'm really passionate about taking kind of the theory and the science and the research that comes from the movement of psychology and applying it. Because for me, if you can't kind of bridge that 
um, divide between theory and practice, then you can't really realize the value. And I suppose my reason for going into psychology was that it's all about helping people and making a difference, and especially to the workplace. So in, I've always been very keen on that kind of application uh, piece. So I guess I've always, um, or for some time, I've wanted to write a book, which is really about trying to do that, trying to take that kind of theory and translate it. And I think that's where kind of Caroline and my partnership really kind of came into play, that I could kind of bring that theory. She's got that um, in-depth kind of experience of working in an organization for a long time. And then together we could do that kind of translation piece and capture it or try to capture it. Hmm. Whereas I didn't want to write a book at all, that was absolutely <laughs> Emily. <laughs> um, but, but what happened was that as as our work grew, uh, we kept getting asked for stuff. So I'd be getting phone calls from people saying, "I've been told to call you. I'm not not entirely sure what it's about." And I'd say, "Or oh, is it strength?" So I'm like, "Yeah, that was it. Where do I start?" Mm -hmm. And um, what we found that was that I, I was spending more and more time with people taking them through the basics, and it was getting quite intense on our time. And we felt that we found that there really was a translation needed from the theory into practice into normal business life for people in organizations just trying to make a difference. Um, and although there's some really great books out there and on the market around strengths based approaches and positive psychology, we couldn't find quite the right material on the market for us to recommend to people in organizations who were keen to make a difference. And we really wanted to enable people to be able to do things for themselves and um, for it to grow as business and usual and take hold more quickly than it can if you're just in a coaching relationship. So um, without us constantly being the catalyst, we were looking for that material to get people going and we needed something to bring it all together because it was getting quite intense to start repeating this. Mm. So that was really the driver. Yeah, yeah well, I think what, what Caroline yeah. just said about kind of helping, you know, letting people apply it for themselves, that, that's been really key, I think, for both of us, actually. I mean, A, there's a reality of, you know, we, there's only two of us and we can't do everything. We're, you know, we don't have endless hours in the day. So in a way, if you want to be able to introduce something into an organisation, you know, you can't do it single-handedly or, or even with, you know, uh, two of us, you can't do that. You need to be able to find a way of helping people to do it for themselves. But I mean, I'd always sort of say, you know, ethically, a kind of sort of part of being an occupational psychologist, occupational psychology for me is all about kind of being able to find ways to kind of share understanding and knowledge and help people, you know, be able to um, do things for themselves. And I think that's kind of a key ethos, as I would think it would be, you know, for coaching as well, that it's about giving people or helping people to understand they already know stuff, because actually quite often with the strength stuff, we sort of say, well, it's kind of obvious, it's intuitive, actually. Um, what we're trying to do is just to kind of draw out that intuition and then help people to think about it more explicitly so they can apply it to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, from your experience, um, thinking about approaches such as positive psychology, strengths, how, how, how would you say that this approach differs from other approaches? perhaps we should start with what me the definition of what we mean by strengths i think there's a there's a bit of a range uh, out there and and for emily and i we say that a strength is something that when applied that being the important bit makes you feel energized and leads to sustainable good performance so there's that feeling element to it um in, in my experience many organizations are very competence-based so they look at what people are good at what they're capable of doing um uh, and that in contrary to what makes you feel good so this is a the, this is probably the most important shift in thinking that, that that's needed across organizations to make that real difference mm. um you know and these are organizations that are heavily based their histories are heavily based on competency frameworks to assess performance competency based interviews to even get in and whilst those can be really helpful they really miss out or don't tell you what people enjoy doing or are motivated by um so what you end up with is organizations uh, who, that can be uh, fairly full of people with really high levels of capability, but lower levels of natural motivation to deliver and, and, and ending up feeling drained and, and less engaged. Um, so really it's that recognition um, and, and being able to enable what's really important to individuals to make a difference um, in, in, in terms of what makes a difference with this approach. Mm. And yeah. if I, oh, sorry, Emily, can I just come in on something? I'm just thinking because you really emphasize the word applied. So I just want to, could you, before I get, move to Emily, is it okay, would you say a bit more about the, 
the applied piece around the performance and energy, et cetera, that you, you touched on? Yeah, so so actually people can know, know their strengths from a profile or, you know, have an awareness of what they really enjoy doing, then they'll probably be good at. But unless they're actually bringing it in to achieve something, then that applied bit is not there. They're not using their strengths. They're just a, a capacity in the background. So it's about really starting to bring that into apply to something that they want to achieve. Hmm. Thank you, Caroline. So Emily, what would you like to add to that? I was, I was just going to um, comment on, so one of the things that I often get asked or, or quite often comes up is, um, you know, how is this different from personality? Because um, obviously a lot of people, you know, in the workplace, I think when they're doing things around kind of behaviour, um, use personality tools. And that's something we've used for a long time, you know, for years in the workplace. So things like Myers-Briggs and um, Insights is um, increasingly popular as well in organisations. And, you know, people really enjoy using them because it helps them to think about, you know, how they behave and perhaps think about how other people behave as well. Um, and, you know, that can be helpful, but what that doesn't do, again, is engage with emotions. So the thing, you know, we like about strengths is that it is all about that engagement with emotions. How do people feel? And also it's a recognition that every single person is unique in that. So, you know, we know actually from neuroscience that every single person's brain is different, it's like a fingerprint. There are no two brains that look the same. And one of the disadvantages, I guess, with personality profiles sometimes is that it can categorize people. That's kind of how they work. It's a way of sort of simplifying people to say, right, well, we can say people are a red or a yellow or a um, INFP or whatever it might be, whatever language you're using. And even if a really good facilitator can then say, well, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't behave in different ways. What tends to happen sometimes in these sessions is that people then go away and it what remains for them is that someone's a red or someone's a yellow and actually that can be um, oversimplistic because you know we all know we're not that predictable actually we're not that definable we're kind of far more complex than that and actually we change day to day and over time we, we kind of you know intuitively we know we, we change and also actually sometimes it might not be inclusive because Sometimes you have a team and, you know, half the people are in one box and then there's one person who kind of is on their own in another box. And, you know, the language is all about, oh, well, it's fine because we need difference. But it, it sometimes it doesn't feel like that. It can feel quite uncomfortable. So, again, one of the things we like about strengths is it's about everybody being different. You know, there are no two profiles. We've never done a session where you'd have two people with the same strengths profiles. It just doesn't ha doesn't happen. And even within the profiles, the subtleties in terms of how they'd apply for you. So it, it just, again, it just doesn't happen mm -hmm. like that. Um, and as, as Caroline was just saying, actually the whole thing about this is thinking about how you can bring your unique self as you are in this moment, in this current moment, because it might change in the future, in order to be at your best at work. And that's the kind of conversation that we want people to start changing towards rather than I am this it's more um, I love doing this you know mm -hmm. I could do this I could use this in my work so it's more a, a kind of um, in the moment action apply thing than something that just sits as a very stable kind of definition mm -hmm. of a person if that makes sense yeah no great and as you say that I mean I connect to the energy because there's often that that bit around you know they they and again, this is just my my reflection. Is just they they link to what's most important to me as well. That's why I've developed a strength around it. Exactly. So, so I just want to just ask a question because I know some coaches or there might be people from organisations listening. What about the concept of overplaying the strength? Then, what what would you say to to that? Because I know with Hogan and other personality measures, yeah. they're specifically looking at some of these aspects. So yeah. Yeah. Um, shall I take that one, Caroline? We, I mean. Um, so there is a so there is a notion of uh, the possibility of a strength overplaying, and I think it's kind of important to explain that a little bit in terms of a um, the notion that you know a strength is it's who you are, so it's a very natural part of yourself. So if I'm someone who um, is uh, has personal responsibility as a strength, I don't have to think about applying that. So I don't have to think, oh, I'm a personally responsible person, so I will volunteer to do something and then I'll be really conscientious about seeing it through. You know, I'll just do it. And so the danger of that is that because it's such a natural thing, you're compelled to use it really. It's not, as I said, it's not within, with conscious thought that you could find yourself volunteering to do too much. So every time someone says, can you do this? 
you know, my immediate reaction would be, yes, of course I can do this. Um, so the overplaying bit is if that starts to cause me a problem. So really it's if you use it in a way that you start to get negative outcomes of some sort, which could be personal outcomes. So maybe I become overwhelmed and I can't deliver. Um, or if you had a strength like detail, for instance, you know, maybe that would get you, get in the way of you delegating because you'd to be, you know, want to be in the weeds and find it really hard to step away from that. Again, not because you're deliberately doing it and not with any intention, it would be that natural thing. Mm -hmm. So we do talk about skillful application of strengths and there's something about being aware and reflecting about how your strength is helping you. And the question really is, what's the best strength for you to be using now in this situation in order for you to achieve what you want to achieve? So if you're trying to delegate, you know, detail is probably not the strength that you want to be bringing out at that moment, but maybe you've got another strength, which is enabler or a steam builder or um, even strategic awareness, because actually in the long term, you're going to have to delegate, otherwise you're going to get, you know, overwhelmed with work. So there's something about being uh, appropriate in your use of strengths. Mm. Thank you. And I, I, I ask that question because sometimes I meet that as a coach, you know, because this is like, can I really, the client, can I really, uh, can I really focus on my strengths? You know, can that become a bad thing? Because it's such yeah. a good thing, you know? <laughs> so thinking about the people that are, are, are listening and I see aid there has just uh, sent, sent some reflections through on the chat panel. As coaches, where should coaches start, you know, in terms of their work with clients? So what should they start with? So we very much re reinforce in the book that everybody needs to start by feeling it for themselves. So start with yourself first and, and whether that, whether you, you are as a coach or whether you're, you've experienced it already and you're coaching a client who's a leader or a change agent or manager in an organization, we very much say start, start with yourself. So um, that can either be just by noticing, starting to notice, perhaps journal uh, when you feel energized versus when you feel more drained and what's going on for you there. Or it could be about doing a profile. And so that there, was, there are various ones out there. We do say, try and have a coaching session on your strengths profile if you're gonna do a profile. It just really brings it alive. It makes such a difference. Um, and, then, and then really we, we advocate that this should be outcome and context focused, that outcome and context are really important. Um, so uh, whether that's with yourself and, and thinking about your own strengths and how you apply it to your, your coaching practice, or whether it's you as a coach with a client thinking about how your client's going to approach this. Um, as a coach, there's a really nice and easy link to the GROW model, I think. So the goal is obviously the outcome that you're after. Um, the reality is what Emily just said. It's about what's happening now in this situation. And in the book, we, we talk about context, context, context. It really is what's going on around you. The options can be those strengths that you've got, that you, maybe they're realized strengths and you're already using them. Maybe they're unrealized strengths and that they're strengths that you know you would love to do if you could bring that into a work setting. So the options could be around what strengths have you got that you could apply to the situation and the will is you know which of these strengths do you want to apply and how um so hopefully there's a, a really easy for, play through in there um i think our hope with the book is that it might be helpful to coaches but really about coaches if they've got a client who gets this approach to be suggesting that this is a way for them to be more more resourceful in terms of how they then apply it more widely within their organization and to give them the context and the, and the options really ideas a little bit of thought as to how they can take this approach more widely themselves and being resourced within the, within their organizations to apply it. Thanks, Caroline. And it really resonates again, uh, the old bit around the coach needs to put these glasses on themselves before they can expect to support someone else to see it, you know? Um, yeah. but again, it's just so energized, even just talking about this. And I imagine for coaches, as you're saying there, who come connected to this, having a resource that can then help them think about the broader organizational context could be so helpful. So, and especially yeah. as they, they, they get energized by it and you just mm. know, you know, when you're on that will stage, what, you know, what, where, where's your will and what do you want to do? You just know if they're connected to it by their energy, mm -hmm. the commitments they're making are much more likely to happen than if it's, well, I, you know, I ought to do these things. So mm -hmm. the, the classic thing of where we're going to as coaches really comes alive in this, I think. No, great. And it's grounded in reality because I, I can do yeah. this. So it's not yeah. hard for me to do it again in this context, you know. Yeah. Yeah. How, how about you, Emily? Just what would you like to add to, add to that? I think there's a, there's a few things that just popped into my head, actually. So, so one is about recognition of um, strengths. And I think that there's two things. So one is about, I think um, you need to be a little bit careful as a coach not to 
assume that you know what your coach's strengths are. So there's something about, you know, strengths are felt. So quite often when we look at someone else and um, we might think, well, um, you know, I think their strength is, um, I don't know, give me an example of detail, let's use detail again. I think their strengths is that because they're really good at detail. You know, I see them doing it really well. And whenever I, we have a discussion, they always kind of drill down to the detail. Um, so it's very easy to kind of assume just because there's a competency that someone is good at something and that they do it because they might do it because it's always been reinforced their entire life that it's good so they kind of keep doing it um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's energizing so there's a real kind of subtlety with strengths is that only the person themselves can really know what they are because they're the only one that knows how they feel you know no one else really knows that they only know it by asking the questions and then communicating that so I think that there's just that kind of point. And then um, obviously there are sometimes non-verbal signs of strength. So you can see when someone's really animated or, or not. But again, people really vary in their emotional range. So for some people, it's really obvious when they're you know, excited about something. But for other people, it's not. Some people have a very high, high but narrow range. So they're excited about everything. So how do you know what's the strength and what's just them being really enthusiastic and excited? Um, that was me at the beginning. Well, uh, absolutely. Surprised and, me. For knowing, and for knowing yourself as well, you know, for some people it's really hard for them to think about, yeah, but what do I really enjoy as opposed mm. to enjoy less, which is Caroline. Um, <laughs> and some people, you know, we have people, especially in kind of the STEM um, professions, you know, with a very narrow, low emotional range where they don't, you know, they're, they're kind of probably not very tuned into their emotions their feelings and nothing really kind of makes them appear that excited and they have to do a bit more work that's where a, a psychometric can be helpful because it can kind of cut through that a little bit to at least to start a conversation about um strengths well, and, and that shared language if you do if you do use a psychometric then use the same one throughout a, a, a team or an organization that shared language really helps for it to take off as well mm. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just 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 was curious then around, um, you know, when you are working with people perhaps who are less familiar or less connected with their strengths, just just what else would you do, Emily, if you say with the STEM example, what, what else might you, apart from the psychometry, what else could you do as a coach, I'm just thinking, to, to really help them make sense of this language, you know? Yeah, so there's something about, um, so again, um, I feel like we keep on referencing the book, but it's just because yeah, it's like fine. all of our thoughts are in there. That's, that's why you're here. <laughs> um, so we do have in the, in the book, there's some kind of hints and tips on identifying strengths. And um, so one is obviously doing a psychometric and that can be helpful. Um, but also there are, um, com there are some questions in there to ask, especially um, if you ask people about kind of childhood memories of what do they naturally do because the whole point about strengths is they are natural they are mm. what you do just because of that's who you are it's what you're drawn to so there's kind of questions about you know what did you do as a child um what activities did you like doing what did you want to learn about what were you always mm. curious about what did you just kind of think about um i read a thing uh sometime which said you know when you pick up a newspaper what's the first section you turn to in the newspaper or a magazine what's the first bit you look at all of that kind of just gives indicators as to where you're naturally drawn to, mm -hmm. what you're naturally gonna find engaging. And that can help to then sort of unravel that. Whereas for some people, as you said, if you just say, well, what do you enjoy at work? Some people might be like, nothing. I, I, <laughs> I, I had exactly that with an engineer, you know, a very scientific end of the scale. And uh, he didn't he didn't have the words at all and he didn't really enjoy it. He doesn't doesn't particularly enjoy work, he said. And, and we just got into what, what, do, what do you do outside of work with your hobbies? And this stuff all came out that was amazing and could so be applied at work. And he just had never thought of it. So by tapping into what you know, what do you love doing, what do you enjoy doing? So even, even with engineers, sometimes I stay away from saying love because they break, they they clam up and that's it. So just what do you really enjoy doing? What's what gives you what gives you energy? And then they start to talk about a hobby or something else. And actually that's the route through. Hmm. So I'm conscious of time and time's flying in terms of this, this conversation. So, so thinking about, about the book, let me end with this question. So, so what three key messages do you hope people will take from the book? 
I'll, I'll take that one, Damien. So I think mm. the first one is, as Emily's reinforced heavily already, emotions matter and they have a key place in the workplace. Um, the second one is that you can make a difference immediately just by asking people what they love to do, not just what they can do. So a, a small change of phrase can make an immediate difference. And the third one is that strengths approaches can be introduced by small experiments, little nudges to business as, business as usual or behaviour. So you can get that difference in inclusivity, well-being and performance by tiny little nudges. And when you say little nudges, again, what, what, what example would you share? It, just as simple as, as the, the second point there. What do you love to do? Yeah. Tell me about what you've really enjoyed doing over the last week. Mm. So, so often... Um, a conversation will be about what went well last week mm -hmm. what, what went well and instead of saying that what did you really enjoy last week what was the mm -hmm. thing you enjoyed the most so a switch like that in, in a conversation whether that's a coaching conversation or whether that's a line manager type relationship can make mm -hmm. a world of difference and really start a whole route of different conversations oh, and we've seen it happen actually in terms of where that then goes yeah, so yeah very yeah. much so thank you Thank you. Emily, just anything you'd like to, to add about the book that hasn't been shared already? Just just any final thoughts? Um, I think one thing I just uh, realised that we kind of haven't touched on at all, and it's always just good to caveat it, is that um, we don't in, we don't um, ignore weaknesses. So I just think actually to realise we haven't mentioned that at all. And uh, one of the problems with positive psychology sometimes is people think, oh, it's all just kind of, you know, Pollyanna and just saying everything's wonderful. And we just talk about what's great all the time. And it's really important to say that this approach is not that. It is absolutely grounded in reality. What we're just trying to do is to correct that negativity bias that we have as a very natural thing to point us towards the positives. And then with weaknesses or where there is gaps, we take a different approach. So again, we haven't got time to go into all of that, but there is something about just approaching them in a different way, moving away from de developing them to managing them and actually, yeah, but, but certainly not ignoring them. So it's probably mm. just worth saying that. Ideally wearing them with pride because they don't get in the way, but that's where you want to get to. <laughs> yeah, well, and, I, and I think, you know, as a, as a coach though, if you've got somebody who's very much in a difficult space, you know, connecting them to this energy and passion and what they love to do can really create a shift in terms of their creativity and the way that they're approaching the situation as well. So I think it's, it's not underestimating the energetic shift it can create when we do this as a coach. So, yeah, but I, there's so much more I'd like to, to ask you, but just in terms of the book, just anything around where people can get the book from or if they're interested so um, Amazon, I, I, I'm afraid I have to say that because it, <laughs> it, is, it is on Amazon, of course, but also local book, bookshops, uh, Waterstones. So there's kind of um, various links. I think um, actually on the, uh, the Applied Psychology website uh, on the front page, there was a link to the local bookshop uh, link as well as to um, Amazon. So if people kind of want to try and find a source outside of Amazon, which I know quite often people do want to, then that is there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Really, really appreciate you sharing um, your, your thoughts today. And I'm sure it had a, an impact with, with the people listening. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing for us to take away as coaches about how we reflect on our pra practice with this lens as well. Just picking up that, that small nudge you mentioned, Caroline. Um, just for those listening, just to mention um, our next webinar, 13th of September. So please date in your diary, one o'clock UK time. I'll be talking to psychologist Sarah Rosenthal about her, her new work around purpose. So we'll be looking at specifically coaching purpose. So really sort of building on this theme of positive psych as well. Um, and uh, finally, hopefully there's some of you coming on Friday to our CPD event. Really looking forward to seeing you for our day on the dynamics of team coaching as well. So thanks for dialing in, go well in the meantime, and I look forward to connecting again in September. <laughs>